Welcome back, everybody. This is Semantics Podcast. I have here with me Jamie Howell. Hello. And your faithful guest, uh, Reese Harrison, right now on the mic. Yes. It's, yeah. <laughs> this is the first podcast of 2016, I believe, and we're kicking it off with a recent graduate, teacher's assistant, and all-around smarty bum, <laughs> Duck's first two years. Yeah, Duck's um, first two years, so in the undergraduate we co-cart brought in ducks and that was in second year and I got it for second and third year. I second was third. pretty happy with that. Cool. So um, you would have seen Jamie around. She teaches. Yeah, I've done pass. Um, I was a demonstrator, so a teacher's assistant. And then I was a tutor for human phys and human anatomy. And um, yeah, so you would have seen me lurking around, and especially if you went to the student clinic in the last two years. Yeah. And as a recent graduate, um, where will we see you now? Well, um, that is the question of the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will be heading to Byron. Um, I'll be working with George Stillian and Josh Livis. I'm pretty happy to be a part of George's team um, and working with Julie Struckfuss as well. And then also teaching at the uni still because I really love that. Yeah. And you've got some good connections here at the uni. Yeah, um, I think that's one thing that I'm really happy that I did is I networked and I looked at the teachers with respect, but also realized <clears throat> that they were soon to be colleagues and to, you know, talk to them as if they're humans and go for go to them for help. And I think they could recognize that I was just generally really interested in osteo and they appreciated yeah. that. So now, you know, I um, work for... a a company that holds CPD workshops and I also teach for them in the anatomy labs with Julie Streckfuss. So, and we've had Paul come and um, work for us as a guest lecturer. So I've been working with these guys during my degree and um, I think that's been really helpful now that we have that relationship and I can continue it now that I've finished uni. It's really opened up a lot of doors for me. That's, um, that's one thing that I wanted to highlight with today was the the rigid and very condensely packed osteo course that we have here how do you manage to fit in being a teacher's assistant as well as getting getting good grades and maintaining your focus well um if you take a look at all the extracurricular things i do they're all related um, I think that helps because then it's like sneaky study. And um, in the undergraduate, the um, extra things I did was more along the lines of pass. So because I was a bit of a raging geek, <laughs> I um, got asked to be a peer-assisted um, student. So I would run the pass session. So that's peer-assisted study sessions. Yep. Um, we didn't actually have that when I was in first year or I didn't know about it. Um so it was really um, a unique opportunity to be given. And it um, because I got such good marks, I didn't have to study too much to then teach it. Yep. It was more about learning how to redirect questions and we weren't actually allowed to teach. So I got really clever with how I designed the study sessions to have sneaky teaching and leading within the activities and things like that. And um, so that kept me up to date with my human anatomy and my human physiology. And I found that really helped because as you know, or you will find out, or for those who aren't osteos, <clears throat> sorry, um, in our osteo classes, we're always asked about anatomy. And yep. so I was basically getting paid to revise. So that was handy. And it's to, to teach others. They, I think it was Amanda that really drilled it into to myself. Um, if you can't teach it, you don't know it. Exactly. And, um, and Amanda drilled that into myself as well. And the other thing that was really helpful in the undergraduate and went along those lines is the fact that I studied with two other guys, Sunny and Lockie. And so what we did is one of us was always better at one of the units and that would be what we would teach. And we'd always sit together and we'd teach each other. And <clears throat> that really helps maintain focus because... Yep. When you can't be bothered studying, they'll drag you along. And yep. they're my friends as well, so it was really fun. And um, so, yeah, we would teach each other. So we basically drew from that for pass. And then 
um, towards the end of third year is when I really started doing going to a lot more courses. Um, yes. And so I think because the first couple of years, I really buckled down and studied a lot and my balance probably wasn't quite right, but I think it needed to happen for me so I could prove to myself that I could do this degree. Balance is important. Um, yes. And those short courses, yep. you've, you've attended some. Yes. And I believe you've also assisted in some. Yes. <laughs> now, how have those short courses, and for those that are listening that might not understand what short courses we're talking about, these courses are like weekend courses that are held in Byron or surrounding areas yeah. that you that you pay to go to and it's taught by a, a, an osteopath or is it just osteos? Um, I've <clears throat> In my master's, I went to a couple of courses that was predominantly run, ran by osteos, yep. but then also dentists. So it was a craniodental course right. and things like that. Right. Um, and just because, you know, dentists have a lot of knowledge in the head and mm -hmm. the anatomy and conditions. So that was a pretty cool course to go to. Yep. But um, yeah, most of them have been run by osteopaths. Now, do you, how have these courses shaped the way that you want to take your um, osteopathy? Because osteopathy is such a broad thing. Yeah. The beauty of it is you can really make it your own. Yeah. And there's a lot of variability between one osteo and another. Yeah. And that's, that's something really exciting. A little bit of a tangent, but I think is kind of relevant. So just remind me of the actual question when I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, is the great thing that I've noticed through all of these courses and then also observing a lot of different osteopaths is that it's really shown me that, um, you know, you can be who you are through your osteopathy and um, that people's personalities really shine through their treatments. As long as you're practicing within the principles and philosophies, yep. it's okay. And that was something that was really comforting to me because I would see these amazing osteos and want to be them, but that's impossible to be someone else. You have to be yourself. Yep. But knowing that I was competent in um delivering certain techniques and competent in understanding the philosophies and principles to then bring those techniques into an osteopathic treatment. Yep. That really was, yeah, it made me feel a lot better knowing that it's okay to treat how you treat, even if it's not exactly the same as everyone else. It's your intent. And yeah. that was really great. At what point throughout the five years of your degree and whether or not you're still discovering that, but at what point did you, stop trying to replicate and start to, I guess, emulate slightly and take bits and pieces and make it your own. Because the first three years, I think the first year is about touching and feeling and, and getting used to handling a body. <laughs> nice words. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second year, I believe, is more focused um, on segmental regions of the body. I'm not quite sure. I'm only starting second year this year. Yeah. And third year, I believe that's when you start to get into um, prepping for your for your OSCEs. Yeah. And okay. which gets you into your masters. Yeah. Am I on the right track here? Um. Yeah. You've you've taken bits of it. Um. From my experience, the first year was yeah definitely about learning how to handle the body and yep. move the body, which is why sometimes people who have already been practitioners find it a bit slow. Sure. But um, it's. For myself, and I came from a background that had nothing to do with being a practitioner, it was really good to learn to get that confidence to move the body. And those directions and positions we were putting people in build into um, techniques later on. And that's something I realized. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, second year is about assessment, um, your 13 step screen, and yep. you start learning some um, basic techniques. And um, so you start to build confidence. And um, I know that they're each year they've changed it a bit, but that's mm -hmm. what that's about. And then um, in third year, you do HVLA that everyone's really excited about. And by the end of the year, you're so over HVLA. Cause you've and been... for those listening, what, what is HVLA? High velocity, low amplitude. So you're cracking. In the the cracking. Populations. Yeah. yeah. Everyone loves a good crack. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, um, I myself, and I guess a lot of others, I like to crack myself, which yeah. I'm learning now is is a big no-no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not great. Um but so I think in first year, I wasn't really 
trying to be anyone or anything. Um, it was more that I was learning how to be a student. I think that was my biggest lesson in first year. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Why would that be though? Because um, I actually didn't finish high school. So I'm a high school dropout, <laughs> but that wasn't... There you go, see? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was more for health reasons. I was quite sick as a kid and I missed out on a lot of high school. Um, I've got Crohn's disease and I was hospitalized a lot and nearly died and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I missed out on so much high school that even though I tried to maintain doing um, on in the West, in Western Australia, it's called your TEE, but basically your HSE or whatever you call it on this side Your of the final country. year yeah. 12 examinations. Yeah, but um, in year 11, I was... Um, doing those units and I missed out on more school. So then I had to drop down to non HSC or non university entry units. Um, then I got hospitalized again. Um, and I just realized that I wasn't getting anything out of what I was doing at school and I was really bored. So I left and went to TAFE and got hospitalized again. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I didn't, and I had to quit TAFE as well because I was stuck in hospital and so I had never really developed any solid um, learning skills or yep. I didn't feel like I was very disciplined yep. in studying and I'd never finished anything. And so I was actually working for a mining company and they wanted to send me to uni to either become or to study business analysis or occupational health and safety um, and to then train me to become a safety analyst. Now, I had the potential to earn a lot of money doing that, but I hated the job. And yep. as while it was easy, I probably would have ended up throwing cats at people in 10 <laughs> years. And that's yeah. not what I wanted to do. I'd always had an invested interest in health because of my health issues. Mm-hmm. And so I did some research and um, actually went on holiday to New Zealand and met an osteopath and she explained what she did. And I was already looking at... So that's how you found about yeah. osteopathy. I had already been looking at physiotherapy or becoming a chiropractor, but it just didn't really sit with me and I thought I might get bored. I have yep. a tendency to get bored easily. <laughs> and um, when she explained osteopathy to me, it just really resonated with me. And so I went home and I did some research and found out it was only offered in Lismore and Melbourne. Yep. So I applied, um, I got into SCU and I quit my job and that all happened within about three months and I was over here. So it was really fast, but I was really quite scared that this was now university. I didn't finish high school or TAFE. Yep. Could I do this? And I'd given mm-hmm. up such a big opportunity in Western Australia. So <clears throat> I really pushed myself to make, to basically prove to myself that I could do it, which is, but I didn't have any um, skills in my toolbox with learning. So that's why it was really about learning to be a student. That's something that I took from the first year as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think in high school, I only choose my units. I only chose my units in high school based on the assessments that were required. (laughs) And I did music, drama, entertainment, um, English, which you had to and general mathematics. So I did nothing health related. Yeah. And, um, yeah, my first year I, I, kind of realized that it's not about learning the content of the units. It's also establishing your, um, your the correct attitude mm. and your approach to study and what works mm. best for you. And then second year, just keep on going through that. Yeah. But now I feel like I've got it as a habit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's throughout this whole uh, summer session off for the holidays, I've still come into the library and I've still done readings and, not all of it's about osteo or, or the body, but nonetheless, I, I I found that I legitimately love learning. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's really great. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this, actually not unfortunately, um, but I feel that a lot of new students that come to uni, they could have got great, right, really good marks in their HSC or final exams, wherever they are. Um but they still don't know how to adapt to such an open environment and the university culture in terms of learning and academia is solely based on what you put in. Yeah. <clears throat> Unlike high school where teachers will dictate what you learn. And hold your hand. Exactly. And lead you through the park. Yeah. We show you the park, we show you the playground mm. and we 
tell you how to play, but you ultimately have to do it yourself because Mm -hmm. it's adult learning. And um, a couple of things that helped me was um, I actually looked up VARC, which is about learning styles. Yes. And I tell all my students about this. And you can go online and you can fill out a questionnaire. And basically what it does is it helps you figure out if you're a visual learner, if you're an audio learner, if you're kinesthetic, um, or if you're oral. And what I found was that I was mostly visual and a little bit oral. And that makes sense because I struggle to listen to a lecture and take a lot in. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what I found is that if I could record a lecture and then write notes, that helped because with writing notes, they're colourful. They've, you know, these headings have got a certain colour and special words have colours and I try to draw pictures and things like that. And then what I noticed is... Um, I could then visualize my notes and things like that. And then the oral thing comes in with teaching others. And so that's where Lockie and Sunny were amazing because I had the amazing notes and then I got to look at them again by teaching them via my notes. And so that, that was one thing that really helped. And I find that students get a lot out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I remember when I was studying anatomy, my approach to it, because it's such a rope learning subject, Mm. um, was just, focus say on the forearm all the different muscles and just remember the terminologies yeah and then just try recall that way it's such a long long way but it seemed to work for me i've got books just just with repetitious writing of just <laughs> the same words over and over again yeah. um but now i feel like you know as tedious as that was it got me into that focus zone yeah so maybe i'm not much of a visual learner I'm more of a repetitious learner yeah. and I just drill it, drill it, drill it. So my recall is still there. Yeah. Well, I find for when you're learning structures, you have to do the rote learning. But so that's the difference between anatomy and physiology. When you're mm. learning anatomy and the structures, it is repetition, repetition. Yeah. And I found some really good websites online that are basically look, cover, right, check. Because I did the same thing. Yep. I print out pictures and then in pencil would do look, cover, right, check and yep. rub it out, rub it out. Because they say the best way to study for an exam is the way you're going to be examined. Because, and then we have to write our answers out. So you, yep. you're you not only um, creating that memory pathway, but a motor pathway by doing the writing. Mm. Whereas physiology, I find that if you can understand the concept rather than rote learning the concept, you're, far, you're in a far better position to answer questions about the concept. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been very successful with the marks you've gotten, Ducks, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. How else should uh, students stand out from the bunch if they want to? Like it's. Well, <clears throat> that's that's an interesting question because I I didn't consciously, or maybe I did, but not so much. I think it was more of a subconscious thing um, to try and do that. But I think it was just that I really wanted to know and learn everything and that's kind of where my marks came from and then I think as cliche as it sounds a can-do attitude and genuinely being interested um you know you've got to remember that as an osteo we have people coming to us with health problems and they trust in our knowledge and I didn't want to let them down there is a big responsibility on our hands exactly and um I think I am just naturally curious and that helps. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm an analyzer and I like to think about things and, mm-hmm. you know, question it. And um, then I would go to the lecturers and talk to them about it because I think sometimes students forget that the lecturers are people. And Yes. They and want people to be intrigued and they want yeah. them to ask questions. And they... they you know, they love osteo too. So yeah. they love talking about it and you can get into some really cool conversations and they can port, they point you into some really cool directions based on your questions yeah. that may interest you. And, and not just osteo, any degree really. Yeah, The exactly. lecturers are there because they want to teach. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine anything worse. Actually, you know, you can, you can, I suppose you can talk about this. Yeah. When you're teaching to a room full of students. Yeah. And... I guess to go back to the high school high school days, if they're just sort of looking down, twiddling their thumbs, not paying yeah. attention, not being, not actively listening, I suppose you could call it. Yeah. Um, with those students, do you go, okay, that's their prerogative, that's their agenda. I'm going to focus on the students that are. Well, see, what I've found is um, 
w- well, what I do, for example, in the anatomy or the physiology labs is, you know, I get quite animated and I really try to make the information relatable and I'll use real life examples or relate it to real life examples. And I'll, I'm, I'll make a couple of jokes and try to liven it up a little bit. Because you're a student as well. Yeah. You I know, don't you know what it's my, like. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. take myself too seriously. I mean, I am a serious lecturer, but then when I yep. notice that students are on their phones or playing on Facebook or, you know, I just, I'll go up to them and say, Hey guys, like, you know, A, you're not meant to be using Facebook in here and yeah. B, you don't have to be here. So if you don't mm. want to actually engage with the material, we may as well just go and do Facebook outside or exactly. somewhere else. Yeah. But if you want, you can learn these five structures and I'll be back in 10 minutes. And then that kind yeah. of motivates them to be like, oh, crap, I have to, yeah. you know, buckle down. Or I'll say, are you struggling with something? Here, let me explain this to you. And and then I'll just explain it anyway. And they'll, you know, they will usually listen. But, you know, and then I explain to them that you need to, especially those units because they're so big, you need to engage with the material and you can these are some tips and tricks that I use to make it a bit easier, a bit more interesting and things like that. Yeah. So you try to motivate them, but you know, there's always the students that don't really want to be there, but yeah. I just at uni because that's the next step in life. That That's a good point. And I, I really do believe that you've, you've spent, if you're a recent graduate from high school, you've spent 13 years up to mm-hmm. 13 years of constantly learning. Yeah. Um, and then you come to, to university and osteo is a five-year degree soon to be a four-year degree um but nonetheless that's 17 18 years of just head in the books just listening to people teach you stuff yeah do you notice a compare uh, do you notice a a distinct difference between mature age students that may have had a few years off traveled worked really crappy shitty jobs (laughs) realized i got to do something before this is my life yeah i.e. what I did, <laughs> yeah. um, compared to those that have just finished high school and haven't really had much of a real world um, experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, what I did notice is that people who have come just out of high school, now this is a generalization. So uh, yes, yeah. Um, there are definitely um, fresh students from high school that are amazing. Absolutely. Because they yeah. just, they've got a system and they've got it down and they can just smash it out. And yeah. then that's when the mature age students get all jealous because they're, they're so much younger and, they're, and they've been yeah. learning and their brain knows what it's meant to be doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I do notice comparatively to that is the mature age students. And I seriously take my hats off hat. I've got multiple hats hat off <laughs> to these people who have families and dependents and they mm. are coming to uni and they're putting so much time and dedication in mm-hmm. to study. And, um, because, you know, I was flat out looking after myself, let alone other people. And I have people come up to me that, that, that have families and they go, Reese, you know, why are you always in the library? Like, how do you do it? And I go, well, I don't have a family. Yeah. You've got children at home. Yeah. There's a reason that it's harder for you. Yeah. And I think, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. If you've got a family at home and you're, and you're trying to study, but you're not quite getting the grades you want That's at the okay. end of the day, who really yeah. cares? Because yeah. you have more priority than me. Yeah. Although you know? one thing I did think about is it does force them to have a bit more balance because you can't neglect your children. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the main differences um, is that the mature age students tend to be able to, this degree requires a lot of time. I've been told by people who aren't even in this degree that work at the uni, that it's one of the hardest degrees they offer and the most full on. So they're able to put in the time, whereas the younger students, um, they get a bit distracted by parties and um, the fact that a lot of people actually move to this area to do this degree. So they're in close proximity to the opposite sex and they're parties and they've got their ID and it's all really new and exciting. And um, so they get, they struggle with the multitasking and the prioritizing and, you know, that's fine. But I think there comes a point where if you're failing quite a few units, you need to stop and go, maybe I should take a year off because yeah. I think people forget that you have to pay your hex off eventually. You got to pay your hex off. And just because you, you don't go straight into uni to get a degree doesn't mean that you won't ever get back into uni. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe it's habit. Maybe it's, I guess, their family's pressuring them. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I, I took, I think... How long did I, I think five years off? And then I realized that I, wow, to get anywhere that I want to be, I've got to get 
the higher education. Yeah. And then turns out that I absolutely love it. Yeah. But that's because I'm doing something that interests me. Yeah. I feel a lot of people that graduate, they uh, graduate high school. They look at something like sport and exercise science or environmental science um, and go, yeah, I like, I like animals or I like sport. I'll do this degree, which is great. Yeah. But they're still umming and ahhing the whole way through. And then you get a lot of um, uh, people that switch, chop and change, which is fine. Yeah. But there comes a time where you must go, my grades, are they reflecting my effort? Yeah. No. Do I put more effort in? I don't want to. Okay. Should you be in this degree? Yeah. So yeah. it's all a big learning experience. It is. And I feel quite lucky to have found something that I'm so passionate about. Yeah. Because some people go through life never knowing what they're passionate about. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one thing that really maintained my focus and drive was the fact that I loved osteo. osteo. It's not a career for me. It's more of a lifestyle. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I, I won't lie. In the first couple of years, there was a few units that I was just, I had to battle through. For example, I hated chemistry in high school. And then when we had biochem for the first six weeks, I hated it with a passion. And yep. I just realized that, you know what? Hating it is not going to make it go away. I yes. just need to get over that hate and then I can get my marks and be done with the unit. The only thing worse is having to do it again. <laughs> exactly. And I managed to smash it and get good marks. Yay. <laughs> good. Good for it's, you. And it was actually quite interesting when I applied myself to it. And, yep. um, and that's just, yeah, I don't know. I think that's where I'm lucky. I love this degree and it's really helped. And, um, and it was really great in third year when the units started um, tying into each other a bit more and and the awesome thing about this degree is you can start practicing stuff from the get-go I mean yeah. you might only be doing massage and moving the body in first year and maybe a couple of METs but it's still fun to do that stuff and by second year you're learning other techniques and I just you know I remember trying to treat my mum when she would come and visit and that was just really fun or treating friends and then in third year you learn how to do more techniques and more assessments and you just build. And that's what really helped keep me interested is yep. the fact that you can be immersed in it. Whereas I've noticed in other degrees, it takes until they do prac at the end of their degree for them to feel like they're actually doing something that is mm. going to be the same as their end result. Almost like hindsight has made them realize that, oh crap, I should have been focusing on this during my degree. Yeah. 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 Whereas osteo, you can, you know, it's, it's actually encouraged. Yeah. To practice in your spare time because you need that palpation skill. Exactly. Now, palpation. Yeah. What is palpation? Have you developed it? Is it this mythical thing? Can you tell us a bit about it? And like, where is yours right now? You've just finished five years. Are you happy with it? <laughs> my palpation's in my hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and my sensory. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, palpation the yes everything something that we're all trying to develop um palpation comes with time um the biggest lesson with palpation i've learned is self-doubt will kill it <laughs> um self-doubt will kill it yes okay um it's well where's my palpation at right now i feel as though well i've i've learned to believe that it's where it should be at um yep. you know i i being the perfectionist I am and the high achiever and I'm always continually trying to compare myself to others. And I think that was one downfall with doing, with observing a lot of amazing osteopaths is the fact that they'd been doing it for 35 years and I was comparing myself to people like that. And, um, which, you know, it's good, but it's not realistic. realistic. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's me. I'm realistic. Um, and then I just realized that it wasn't doing me any good doing that. And, yeah. um, I think it was on the way home from clinic. Um, I think it was Louis. He said to me, or maybe Katie, they said, you've got to stop looking at your life and your skills under a microscope yeah. because you, then you'll never see the change in the progression because you don't see the big picture. And I was like, wow, that is so maybe too so introspective, right. perhaps. Yeah. Well, just, just too narrow, yeah. you know, it, and that's why it was always good to have family come over and visit. I like to time how long it takes my family to mention um, oh, my back hurts or my shoulder hurts when I see them because they're on the other side of the country. Yeah. And I think 
five minutes is the record. In five minutes. Our, they pick me up from the airport, five <laughs> minutes in the car. Anyway. They start sitting down. They start wriggling. Yeah. You, you know oh, in the corner so of your sore. eye. Yeah. The question's going to happen. Oh, like, seriously? <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. But my mum was always great to be like, oh, I remember when you were in second year and you threw a tantrum because you couldn't find my PSIS. And I was like, um, um, oh, yeah, I was like, oh, well, it's good to have that. And she's now, look at you. You've got rid of my back pain and I haven't had it for three months. And um, yeah. so it's it's nice to have someone else be like, no, there is, you have been progressing. Yeah. But um, I think, yeah, so I, I'm not going to lie in – first year I didn't practice as much as I see the first year's practice now like I'm so impressed and it it makes me regret not practicing as much as everyone seems to be doing these days Mm -hmm. and all I can think is how amazing these osteopaths are going to be when they're in fifth year they're going to be beyond us because I think our year as a collective are a little bit slow on the get-go for practicing but um I feel as though my palpation skills they're just increasing all the time and yep. you've got to be doing it to increase it. And um, I think knowing my anatomy really helps. Yeah. And I, I find that while I am palpating, I'm visualizing what should be there. And that's, I think, why AT still was said anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Yeah. Because it is just so important. And um, I also find that, you know, when I go and observe George the man I'll be working for and I get to co-treat or at least just sit and feel it's so nice having that feedback from them to um you know validate I guess not that you should always be seeking validation but it is nice when you're in that nice little checkpoints to go bang I'm here sweet it's noticed yeah good and the one thing that I want to reiterate is the fact that if you think you can feel something or something like that, just go with it because right. if you start to go, oh, I don't think so, like I think that's happening, but I don't think it is, then you just like just take your hands off, take a moment, take a breath and try again and just believe what you're feeling because as soon as you start doubting, you're not feeling. Mm. And you can feel it and there's lots of, Um, studies coming out now about tactile touch and palpation and things like that Mm -hmm. and there's a lot supporting it but you've just got to increase that neural pathway so if you start squashing it with doubt then you know it's where it's going to be so hard to progress and it was really hindering me yeah and so I just decided to go with what I felt and then once I did that and could be quiet in myself then that allowed me to feel more and and you know, we're university, you're being assessed, even when you're not being assessed, really. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's somewhat pressuring. Yeah. But now is the time to make the mistakes and mistaken a, an L5 for an L3 or whatever. Yeah. Especially when you're just hanging out with your cohort and you're practicing. Totally. Um, so, because I got such good marks and somehow that managed to spread like rapid fire through the cohort and um, not just in my year. So I kind well, it's of... it's a good achievement. Let's face it. It's a good achievement. It is. Thank you. Um, but it kind of ended up putting me on this pedestal and I... Um, and, you know, it, it was 80% people putting me on the pedestal and 20% me trying to stay up and maintain that image on the pedestal. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself. And yeah. what I noticed in fourth year is when I was in the clinic and trying to treat people, I wanted to be perfect and I wanted to give the best treatment. And I noticed that if there were things that I weren't quite confident with, I just wouldn't do it because I didn't want to fail it. Yeah. And not that I was not in an exam, but still I didn't want to go for that manipulation and miss it mm-hmm. and have the patient think I'm crap or useless. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why I also struggle to treat family and friends is because I wanted them to still think I was this awesome osteo and I didn't want to treat them and them not get better or something like that. And then their opinion drop of me. And what I realized is you're a student. If you can't make mistakes now, what do you, how are you going to feel when you're actually getting paid to treat people and you can't do those things? And so you just really need to utilize this time 
Yeah. Because if you make a mistake now, you're surrounded by people that can help you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the important. That's the that's the that's the point there. They're surrounded by people that will help you. It's a student clinic. Exactly. They're not, they're not expecting. Exactly. Otherwise, they'll go and pay the hundred dollars somewhere else. Exactly. Rather than the twenty dollars. Exactly. And um, you know, you can learn a lot from your mistakes. Totally. I you, I did. You learn more from your mistakes. Yeah. Than you do from your successes. I would. And it's such a habit to focus on the things you know really good because you want to validate that within yourself and make yourself feel better. Mm. But it's so important to, to focus more so on the yeah. things that you're bad at. Definitely. Because if you can raise that game, yeah, your whole game raises so much. Yeah. And um, yeah, student clinic, student clinic. Exactly. You're all students. You're all still learning. You're all still developing your palpation or your, your treatment strategy. Yeah. And, you know, you've got such great... Um, supervisors there like uh, like Raymond yep Raymond um, Bimby yeah James Andre Joya yeah. they're the ones that I've had Stephen yep I've heard he's good yep I mean I'm not saying that the ones I didn't mention are bad but I just haven't experienced them yeah that's fair enough um, as as you've uh, finished third year yep and you go into to your masters yeah what changed for you there? Well, um, it was, it felt like a bit of a leap, I guess. Um, you know, you're entering your master's, you're now entering the student clinic. Um, that, that was a, that was a bit scary. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it was just a bit of a, a different dynamic, um, the units were pretty fun and they were cool. We got to do a research project. Um, I think the biggest thing was the fact that I was now getting to bring everything I'd learnt together and get to practice being an osteo. And yeah. um, that was both personally and clinically um, a big journey. Um, I grew a lot and um, I also got to start being a tutor in the anatomy and um, physiology lab so I got to run the classes and teach them and that was really enjoyable I yeah. there's just something about teaching that I really love um, I really enjoy sharing information and knowledge and that was something I actually enjoyed in my fifth year was having the students come in and you know teaching them like quick tricks and you know shortcuts and things that took me a while to learn and um, what I did in fourth year and I encourage all fourth years to do it. And I was actually quite surprised when the fourth years didn't do it when I was in fifth year, but I made friends with a fifth year, Mm -hmm. Simon Tasker, loveliest human. And, um, I would go into all the treatments I could with him and watch him. And he would do the same thing and, you know, tell me, Oh, if I do this and this, then I'll check this. And I find this is good. And this is a technique I've learned. And, Mm -hmm. and we practice together as well. Um, and then sometimes he would let me do things in his treatment. So we'd start co-treating the more confident he got within me. And then I would get him to come into my treatments. Now, a lot of people get worried about getting the fifth years to come in because, oh, they're judging me. But, you know, I think it helped that he's, I don't think he has a mean bone in his body, but, um, I got him to come in and it was great for when, you know, I'd be assessing an area and I couldn't feel something or I didn't know what to do next or I was a bit confused. I'd be like, hey, Simon, do you want to have a look at this or what do you think? Mm-hmm. And then he would come and help or show or do any something like that. And then at the end, or if I couldn't get something, like maybe usually if I couldn't get something, it was maybe a HVLA, like a crack, and he would do it for me or tell me what I was doing wrong. And at the end, I'd say, okay, so what was good, what was bad, and what could I improve on? And it was so helpful having that. And um, so it's basically informal mentoring. Yeah. And it's from someone who's just been there. So they are so good at helping you out. And I think it's such a great opportunity. It was kind of sad when the fifth years left and I had to be the fifth year. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, no, who do I steal the information from? I mean, it's the supervisors. But now the role has changed and now you're that person. Yeah. yeah. So I really recommend... I mean, mentoring's great in any profession. They say surround yourself with the people that you want to be like. Yes. And you, yeah. Yep. So I think, yeah, it was just um, great to have him there for that. And then, you know, my first patient, I remember my first patient, 
they, how did that go? Well, Tell us a bit about your first treatment because, you know, yeah. you're, you're Jamie Howe, the Ducks, and uh, you, you had yourself on a pedestal and, uh, and all it, that. Well, you guys put me there. No, I'm <laughs> um, you asked for this. Yeah. <laughs> you created this monster. <laughs> so I was so nervous. Um, they weren't new to the clinic. They were new to me. So I got to look at their file and they had a pretty extensive history. And I was just thinking to myself, why can't you just have back pain? <laughs> why? Something simple just to why do you ease have all yourself. These, like, quite um, intense diseases and viruses and stuff. And yeah, I was just yeah. like, wow, okay. And then I just was like, please cancel, please cancel, please cancel, please cancel. They didn't <laughs> cancel. Selfish. <laughs> and um, <laughs> So they came in and, um, you know, I, I think it was pretty good that I've done public speaking and I, I can fake it before I make it kind of thing. Yeah. And I managed to keep my voice level. And something that I noticed with um, watching other students is – you know, don't forget, guys, there's that, what is it, 30%, 20% placebo effect. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, if I can get that just for my first treatment, that is that is a win. Right. And um, so I just acted confident because you need to maintain that confidence so the patient's confident in you. And yeah. what I'd noticed with other students is they would say things like, oh, I think that's better or I hope that works. Mm. Now, if someone said that to me, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> will it? Yeah. So you need to use the proper language. And um, anyway, so he did just come in for back pain. I was like, woo. Perfect. <laughs> um, and then I just remember coming in because you have to keep going out to talk to the supervisors and I came in for the treatment and I was like, what? What have I learned the last three years? Right. Oh, no. I don't even know what do <laughs> and i just thought to myself when in doubt met because <laughs> we've been doing that for a couple of years and it's safe exactly and um yeah i think i might have done a hvla but i just made sure that i was like oh that feels better because the thing is a lot of patients aren't body aware mm -hmm. and so when i would assess people i'd move them around and be like oh do you feel that how it's not moving or blah 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 and um and then when I would treat them, I would then go, oh, look, that's moving better now. And sometimes, you know, maybe it was only moving 2% better, but I would It was like, still moving better. You weren't lying to exactly. your patient, though, were you? No. no. And um, the thing is, you know, the body will take what I had done mm -hmm. and then heal itself because I'm not... Which is one of the philosophies. Exactly. So I was Principle, just helping sorry. it to get moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, he came back. And yeah. he came back quite a few times. <laughs> so I thought that was good. I obviously was, didn't go full retard mode. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you started it very anxious and nervous. Oh, yeah. And I at think the end of it, it... took a while, a few treatments for different right. patients until I stopped wishing they would cancel. <laughs> and I guess the, the only thing that was uh, hinging on that was your own belief. And whether or not you could do it, you've just spent three years practicing on students in a safe, safe environment. Mm, exactly. And now you've got someone from the public. Yeah. Um, that would be a very big step up. Definitely. And one thing I realized is by wanting to make them better and I wanted to be good for them and I wanted to help them, it was I, I, I. And mm -hmm. it, the treatment isn't about me, it's about them. Yeah. And so I really had to kind of let go of that ego. And um, by doing that, it... It really kind of helped because, you know, it's about them. I can make my treatments when I get treated about me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, um, I think that's a good place to end it. Yeah. Um, hopefully people that are listening, whether you're an osteo student or any other kind of student, you can pick up on some of the things that have been mentioned, you know, about your own personal drive and finding something that, uh, interests you and keeps you motivated and focused and you don't have to be the best high school student to be a good uni student no no you don't and just to remember that you know it is osteo and there's other things we're in the business of people so you need to and that's one thing that set me apart from other students is I networked like crazy and I didn't really do it too intentionally I mm -hmm. just I, I guess I'm hungry for knowledge and um, I would meet these amazing osteos on courses and then I would ask them if I could come and observe them because I wanted to see how they worked and things that they did and approaches and they've always got pearls of wisdom and by doing that I ended up finishing my degree with you know eight different job offers and and now I've got 
such good connections with people that, um, you know, I've been invited to fly down to Sydney for study groups with, you know, these osteos that have 30 plus years experience and I work for a CPD workshop company and I teach at uni now and I'm friends with the lecturers and I do research projects with them. So you, you need to, you know, remember that we're all in this together and we can all share together and don't be afraid to ask because yeah. most people, especially in osteo, um, we live and breathe it. It's a lifestyle mm -hmm. rather than yeah. a career. So we're more than willing to talk about it. I yeah. mean, just, for example, you have, whenever you get a couple of osteos together, I feel sorry for anyone who's standing with them who isn't an osteo because <laughs> it always ends up, we talk yeah. about osteo. Yeah. We can't help it. So people, you know, get out there. If you don't like the way they treat, don't go back and observe them. Yeah. Observe someone else. Now, um, when you when you go out and network, yep. which I feel is one of the most important things of this uni career thing, yeah. Um, do you feel that the people that you're trying to get connected with are solely focused on your grades only? Um, none of them have asked me about my grades. Um, I think you don't have to look at someone's academic transcript to see if they're passionate or to see if they know their stuff or to see that they're intelligent or good with their hands. Yeah. Um, no one's looked at my academic transcript. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure some of them know about it, but it's not what they're looking at. And someone can be amazing on paper, but can't really, you know, resonate that out yeah. in the way that they treat, um, you know, and that's something that, I noticed in the masters when you start treating people it it's about having the practicality and the interpersonal skills and I think something that really helped me is you know I've been on the other side with being sick and I've seen what makes a good doctor and a bad doctor but you know not everyone's going to have that experience but still you got to remember that that's a person on your treatment table and treat them like a person no, yeah. I mean, no one wants to have this robot treating them. Otherwise, they'd go, go to a robot. see the robot. <laughs> yeah. They'll go sit on one of those massage chairs at the the mall. The yeah, mall. Yeah. I'm not American. Um, <laughs> the shopping center. Yeah, that's a good so, point. So, it's... You need to remember that we're in the business of people, like I've already said. Yeah. So, be... Be a, personable. Be, yeah. <laughs> be a human and relate and relatable. So, that... Yeah, that really helps because... You're going to make them feel more comfortable. They'll open up to you more. You'll get more of a history, can build more of a picture of them. And, um, you know, Andre, who I believe you've interviewed. Yeah, fantastic person. He's amazing. And um, so he was one of my supervisors and we would have these chats. Now, there's this really cool website called 100 Years of Osteopathy, I think. and it, A thousand years. A thousand. Yeah, there's YouTube. Yeah. Um, They've videoed all yeah. these osteos and they've asked the same four questions for all of them. So you can kind of, it really shows you how diverse osteopathy is. And we were talking to each other and I, and we're talking about Raymond and how he's such an amazing human and so unique. I've never met yeah. another person like him. And I've often sat down and wondered, how did he get to this point? And how, how did he become such an amazing teacher? How did he become such a quirky individual? And Andre and I were talking about that. And he said that one of the osteos that were interviewed on this thing um, said, you need to know your patients, get to know them. Humans are interesting. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not interesting and the most boring person in the world, how did they ever become so boring? Yeah, there's find always that, that intriguing yeah. aspect to them. And so to find these things out, you need to be personable. And so it really is about that whether you're networking, whether you're treating someone, whether you're even making friends with someone, you know, with your receptionist, it's, we're all, we all crave human connection. So we, why not yeah. facilitate it? Jamie Howe, thank you very much for coming on. No worries. Thank you for having me. Um, all the links, or all the things that we uh, mentioned today in this podcast will be uploaded with the, um, with the podcast itself. So uh, guys, Thanks for uh, listening. Give us a thumbs up or whatever. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Jamie Howe. Thank no you once worries. again. See you Thanks, later, guys. guys. See ya. Be hard.